Hi, I'm Kenny Yates. Welcome to Hold the Hope. And this is our regular weekly message. And today we're continuing our message series entitled Tithing with our second part, The Forbidden City. In this message, we'll find out why it is the forbidden city. In part one, the knowledge tree, we learned that tithing is more than just a 10% obligation, a 10% payment. We transcribed a working definition of tithe. I said that that definition of tithe is that which belongs to God. And today, I want to continue discussing tithe and first fruits. Again, I understand that it is a hard teaching for some. So please, don't turn me off. Just stick with me and weigh what it is that, that I have to say. And then you make your, your own decision. For a message, I'm going to, to go to Brother Malachi for a scripture reading, which is found in Malachi chapter 3, verse 10 through 12. And I have to lay a tedious foundation so that we can fully understand what was going on and so that we can get a glimpse of the times in which the book of Malachi was actually written and the similarities to us today. So please stay with me as I lay this foundation. So turn to the book of Malachi, Malachi chapter 3, verse 10 through 12. Bring the full tithe into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house, and thereby put me to the test, says the Lord of hosts, if I will not open the windows of heaven for you and pour down for you a blessing until there is no more need. I will rebuke the devourer for you, so that it will not destroy the fruits of your soil, or and your vine in the field shall not fail to bear, says the Lord of hosts. Then all nations will call you blessed, for you will be a land of delight, says the Lord of hosts. The first thing I want us to look at is that verse 10. It says, bring the full tithe into the storehouse. God commanded that the, the full tithe, not just part tithe, the full tithe be brought in. Like I said, not a partial, not a down payment, not some now and some later. No, he wants the full tithe. He wants it all to be brought into the storehouse. But why? That there may be food in his house. Now, during times of, uh, of antiquity, the priests earned their living from temple worship. The Israelites would come to worship, they would bring their tithe, they would bring their offerings, and that would be the priest's portion. They would live off of the tithe that were brought. Same as today, our pastors, our church workers make their living from tithes, from offerings, and that's how they get paid. I know some people will say, well, I don't believe that a, a pastor should be driving around in a $100,000 car. And that's okay. Most pastors don't. Then there are others who believe that pastors shouldn't even have a car, much less wearing these expensive clothes. And again, it, it's fine. Don't go to those churches. Don't give your tithes to those churches. But that do not acquit you or release you from your legal obligation and your legal responsibility of bringing your tithe into the storehouse. You are still under obligation. And I don't say that, or, or, or don't say in your heart that that was only in the Old Testament because it wasn't. I covered that in part one, the knowledge tree. I also define what the tithe was, and we just went over that. So, as a refresher, let me just again, one more time, remind you what the tithe is. That which belongs to God. So anything that belongs to God is God's. It belongs to Him, and we are to give it back. Now, let us find out what was going on in our message scripture. During the days of Malachi, the people were robbing God. So let me build a foundation and stick with me as I build this foundation. The ministry of Malachi is dated between 460 and 430 BC, some 100 years after the diaspora. The Israelites had returned 
to the promised land from exile um, somewhere in 538 BC and some 60 years 458 BC Ezra established the nation once again under the, the governorship of Zerubbabel, the temple was rebuilt with the urging and prompting of Haggai and Zechariah, somewhere between um, 520 and 516 BC. They had rebuilt the walls under the leadership of, of um, Nehemiah, the governor, in 444 BC. Now here they are in a lethargic state, waiting on the promised Messiah to come and restore the kingdom to its former glory, ruled by King David. It's much like today. God's people are waiting for the return of Jesus and for him to finally put all things under his feet and take his seat on the throne of David and rule the nations with the iron rod. But it seems like we're just waiting. We're just waiting. But things are beginning to happen now. Look around. We believe with all of our heart that we are living in these end times. Things seem to just get harder and harder. The prophetic promises proclaimed by Jeremiah and Isaiah, and even more recently, the promises of Haggai and Zechariah gave the Jewish people um, hope of a bright and glorious future by assuring the people of the coming of the unprecedented blessings when the temple was completed. The people waited and waited, yet not one of those promises seemed to materialize. Instead, those dreams of grandeur were quickly fading. The excitement and enthusiasm were beginning to wean as widespread poverty began to set in and the people began to become disillusioned with their situation. This was very evident in their attitude towards worship of God through their tithe and their offerings, the tithe and offerings that they brought. The people were bringing animals that were blind, that were crippled, that were diseased or injured, which were forbidden in the, in the law of Moses. God called it wrong. He said it was contemptible and burdensome. He said that they were defiling him and profaning his name, his holy name. And he was upset about it. Some of might ask, but what does that have to do with tithing and first fruits? Well, I wanted to describe the situation that the Israelites found themselves in. Because you may feel like you're in just such a situation. And I want to encourage you to keep holding on. Keep on doing what you're doing. Do Keep on doing what is right in God's sight. He will raise you up in due season. These people, they had great promises of life filled with prosperity, splendor, and the greatness that was painted by the prophets. They were looking for a bright and glorious future, yet nothing but poverty and scorn was their lot. When the, when the church finds itself in hard times because of the economy, what's the first thing that goes? That's right. The tithes and offerings. But not by everyone, mind you. But a lot, the majority, they see it that they have no other choice. I can't afford to. But someone said, you can't afford not to. Well, that is where the Israelites found themselves. They were holding back on tithes and offerings. And they were, were what they were given were, were just little scraps that were left over. Their giving had gone down. And the house of God was beginning to fall into serious lack and disrepair. They probably vowed to give this animal or that animal, but because it was the healthiest and it could bring the most money, they held it back and sacrificed another uh, animal that was less healthy, that was less valuable, and kept the healthy one to maybe be a stud, something that brought in more money that added to the bottom line. In this turmoil of spiritual confusion is where we will pick up the story. The people of Malachi 
in the days of Malachi, they were growing spiritually cold. They still brought offerings, but the offerings were not the offerings that were pleasing unto God. They brought just any old thing. Any old thing will do. As long as, long as we brought an offering, God should be happy. It's like today. Some people will drop a dollar in a plate as it goes by and think that they did God a favor. At least I gave something. Remember, it's not about the money. God does not need your money. It's about the relationship that you have with Him. It's all about storing up treasure for you in eternity. But we're going to talk more about storing up treasure in eternity in, in our next our next um, message. It's like when we come to praise and worship and we just don't feel like it today. So we're not going to sing with conviction. We're just not going to do it. We're kind of going through the motions to the point where we're only mouthing the songs because our heart is not in it. God is not pleased with that. It's a deaf and mute sacrifice. It's crippled. Maybe you had fallen out with your wife, or maybe you and your husband had, had words before worship. So you don't feel like worshiping today. Maybe it's you had a problem with your sibling, or your parents, and you had a disagreement. So your heart just isn't in it. I'm not feeling like it today, Pastor. I'm not feeling like it today, Sister. Do you think God is pleased with that insincere, shallow offering? Well, it'll have to do because that's all I got. Do you think God finds a pleasing aroma in that? I don't think so. It's not hurting anyone or it's not hurting the one that you're upset with. It's only hurting you and your relationship with God because praises belong to God. And if you withhold your praises from God, you withhold it from God and not man. It's to your shame and your misblessings. You cannot steal what belongs to God without consequences. Let us think about Jericho, the forbidden city. Joshua chapter 6, verse 17 through 21. And the city and all that is within it shall be devoted to the Lord for destruction. Only Rahab the prostitute and all who are with her in her house shall live, because she hid the messengers whom we sent. But you... Keep yourself from things devoted to destruction, lest when you have devoted them, you take any of the devoted things and make the camp of Israel a thing for destruction and bring trouble upon it. But all silver and gold and every vessel of bronze and iron are holy to the Lord. They shall go into the treasury of the Lord. So the people shouted and the trumpets were blown. As soon as the people heard the sound of the trumpets, the people shouted a great shout and the wall fell, fell down flat so that the people went up into the city, every man straight before him, and they captured the city. Then they devoted all in the city to destruction, both men and women, young and old, oxen, sheep, and donkeys with the edge of the sword. Jericho is another example of tithing that does not involve the 10%. As per a working definition, or better yet, it could be considered first fruits. Either way, it still all belongs to God. And we are to render unto God what is God's. Let us remind ourselves what the working definition of tithe is. That which belongs to God. Listen to what God said. All of the silver, all of the gold, every vessel of bronze, and all of the iron are holy to the Lord. They shall go into the treasury of the Lord. It all belonged to God. Everything 
belonged to God. And it was to go into his treasury. The Israelites were not to take any of the devoted things. Why? Because it belonged to God. Jericho was the first city that the Israelites took in the promised land. Therefore, it was God's portion. It was his first fruits. Today, we're not farmers. We don't raise crops. We don't raise livestock like that. And even if we did, we wouldn't come to church uh, on a Sunday dragging old Betsy's newborn behind us and, well, pastor, this is the firstborn. Where do you want me to put him? No, we are a financial society. We deal in currencies, cash, if you will. When we get paid, the tithe is the first thing that comes out of our account or out of our paycheck is the first check we write or the first bill that we pay is the very first thing that comes off the top of our increase. But in the first battle, the Israelites were not to take any of the spoils because it belonged to God. They would have plenty of opportunity to collect spoils from the other battles that they were to fight. Everything here, or everything after this, would be theirs. They would be able to collect it. They would be able to keep it. But this one belonged to God. It was a trust thing. Trusting that God will do what he said that he will do. No one was supposed to touch any of the spoils in Jericho. It all belonged to God. It was the tithe of the first fruits. And that's why it was the forbidden city. Joshua placed a curse on anyone who would rebuild that city that was dedicated to destruction. It goes back to what we talked about in part one. It's all about the relationship and not the money or the things. God wants your heart. All God asks for is 10%. Not even a tip at a restaurant is that low. The other 90% is yours to do with as you choose, as long as you're given some offerings along the way. Here is the, or, 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 there's, there's one thing though that we have to consider about the tithe. You can't stay camped out in what does not belong to you. Because desire and greed will begin to fill your beady little eyes as it did Achan. Neither can you take what belongs to God without consequences. That's why it's the first thing that we have to write. It's the first thing that we get out of our account. It's the first thing that we take off the top of our paycheck because it do not belong to us. It belongs to God. Both Adam and Achan bore the consequences of their actions. Look at what happened to Achan. As Achan was walking through the city of Jericho, he saw the beautiful clothes, the shiny silver, and the glimmering gold laying amongst the spoils of Jericho. And he coveted them in his heart. Lust built up in his heart. And he craved the things that belonged to God. So looking here and looking there, he made sure that no one saw him. And he stole the things that belonged to God. And God saw him. Now, Mind you, Achan could, would, would have the opportunity later on to, 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 to share in all of the spoils of war. Everything that they fought for in every battle after that would be his to share in. But this one, this one, he was not to touch because it, it must be an act of faith that God is faithful and that he was going to give to God what belongs to God. And God's portion comes first. It was a trust thing from both sides. Could God trust Achan? And could Achan trust God? But either way, you cannot steal what belongs to God without consequences. Otherwise, when you steal from God, God considers you a robber, and a curse will be upon you and your whole household as it did Achan. And Achan and his whole family paid with their lives. Why? Why the whole, the, the whole household? Why, why the whole family? 
Well, after Achan got home from the battle of Jericho, he dug a hole in the ground inside his tent in plain sight of his whole family and he hid the treasure he had stolen. He probably showed his family, even bragged about it, how much it was worth. So, and his wife did nothing. Therefore, she partook in Achan's sin. So when the army went up to fight, the, 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 uh, fight Ai, the battle of Ai, which was a much, much smaller city than Jericho, they were beaten back because the whole community was in trouble because of Achan's sin. Joshua called the people of Israel together and God revealed to him the offending party. And who was it? It was Achan. He and his whole family was stoned to death because of, of it. But don't worry, we don't stone people today. But I do believe that God still expects you to give to him what is his. As Jesus said, render unto God what is God's. If you haven't been bringing your tithe, your full tithe, into the, into the house of God, it's not too late. You can start right now. Make it the first thing you do after you get paid so that your relationship with God can grow, so that your relationship with God can flourish, so that your relationship with God can blossom and bloom and bear fruit so that you might prosper. So my question today is, do you have a relationship with God? If you don't, you can. He has made it really easy for us. If you would like, today can be your opportunity. Let this first Sunday of February, February 2022 be the day you give your heart to the Lord. Do you realize that your heart belongs to him? Your soul is his. He bought and paid for it with his own blood when he hung on the cross on Calvary's hill. It is his. He would like it back. Would you give your soul back to him today? Would you give your obedience to him? Would you give your love to him? I urge you. Give your love to Jesus because he loves you. If you would like to give your heart to Jesus, this is what you do. Follow me in this prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for loving me. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for dying for me. Thank you for purchasing me back. I bring my heart now to you. I bring my will to you. I bring my soul to you. I bring all my needs, my wants, my desires, and I lay them at your feet. I say, have your way in my life. Forgive me of my sins. Cleanse me, Lord. Help me to live for you. Help me to be faithful to you. In Jesus' name, amen. If you prayed that prayer, the Lord is faithful and just to forgive you of your sins and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. I urge you, get yourself a Bible. If you already have one, take it out, dust it off. Begin to read it. Read it every single day. Get a highlighter. Highlight those verses that are meaningful, those promises that are meaningful. Find yourself a Bible-believing church. If, 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 the, if you seem like the pastor's having too much being paid too high, don't go to that church. Find a Bible believing church, one who believes that there's still a thing called tithing. Pay your tithe in that church. Work in that church. Be discipled in that church. And when Jesus comes back, he'll find you doing everything that you're supposed to be doing. And he'll say, well done, my good and faithful servant. Enter in now to the joy of the Lord. And he'll take you to be with him for all eternity. This little thing that, that we have here is nothing compared with what God has in store for us. So be faithful. Thank you so much for joining us. I'm Kenny Yates. This is Hold the Hope. Be blessed and stay blessed.